Mistress from the files of Arthur C. Clarke, scientist, writer and visionary. The scientist who invented the communication satellite, the writer of 2010. And now in retreat in Sri Lanka, the visionary who ponders the riddles of this and other worlds. These are the ramparts of the great fort of Gaul, built by the Dutch in the 17th century to defend themselves against invaders from the sea. The place is steeped in atmosphere, and many of the locals swear that at sunset they've seen the spectral figure of a Dutch lady floating silently along these battlements. Like the citizens of Gaul, everyone loves a good ghost story. But to many people, they're more than mere fiction. According to a British survey, one person out of ten claims to have encountered a ghost. But what have they really seen? The dead returning or merely figments of their own imaginations? place where serious ghost hunters come in their quest for truth. The Windy City. Come on everybody, it's time to begin the tour. You follow me, we'll board the bus right now. We're about to take the Chicago Supernatural tour and we'll be visiting the most haunted places on planet Earth here in the city of Chicago. And among these concrete canyons, no one is more expert on the evidence than their guide, Richard T. Crow. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Chicago Supernatural Tour. The trip you're about to take this afternoon runs some five hours in length. We'll be traveling over 100 miles, visiting 13 locations around Chicagoland. Haunted cemeteries, murder sites, other weird locations where people like yourselves have experienced strange and unusual phenomena. We've got something for everybody on board the tour today. If you don't find a ghost that fits your particular needs, you might want to consider wanting a certain stretch of road when you leave this world. We'll bring our bus by and point you out on future tours. On our left is Resurrection Cemetery, the largest cemetery in North America. And it's best known here in Chicago as being the home of the best known, best loved, and most often encountered ghost, Resurrection Mary. She's been seen, for instance, by Jerry Palis, a Southwest Side man, who in 1939 danced with Resurrection Mary. As we uh, finished the dance that evening, we went to the car, and she says, since you got a car, to uh, take me to Archer Road. So as I took her to Archer Road, uh, she said, stop, I want to get out. She says, I want to go across uh, the road. I says, well, that's a cemetery across the road. And she says, that, that I know. She says, let me out, please. And as she crossed the road and she approached the uh, resurrection gates, she uh, uh, dematerialized. So then I knew that she was a ghost. That's why her hand was cold and uh, her sw small uh, of her back was cold at all times. And being an ex-funeral director and, and bomber, I, I knew that uh, uh, she was something else to, than what, what I thought she was. Then there was the case of Sean and Jerry Lape. In 1978, while driving past the cemetery, they suddenly saw a girl dressed in white run in front of the path of their car. The car struck the girl. There was no thud or bump, but she just disappeared as she ran towards the fence and dematerialized. We're lifelong residents of the southwest side of Chicago, and we know the legend of Resurrection Mary. But no one expects to hit her late one night coming home from their mother-in-law's. I didn't feel anything. There was no bump, no jar, nothing. It wasn't like we hit a human. Here in Mount Carmel Cemetery are the graves of many famous Italian Chicago businessmen. If you look out the window on your right, we're coming up to the grave of probably the most famous, Al Capone. Al was a 
mother's boy during life, and he lies buried next to his mother in death. After the St. Valentine's Day Massacre in 1929, Al was haunted by James Clark, the first man to die in that massacre. It's said that Clark's ghost haunted Al all the remaining years of his life. This life-size stone monument marks the resting place of Giulia Bacola Petta. She's called the Italian Bride, that's how she's depicted in the monument, and she was buried in her wedding dress after she died in childbirth at the age of 29 in 1921. Now, sometime after Giulia's death and burial, her mother, Philomena Bacola, began to have a series of unusual dreams. In those dreams, Giulia came back and begged and pleaded with her mother to have the grave exhumed. Finally, when permission was given, Six years had passed. It was now 1927. The grave was opened. The casket taken out of the ground. And when opened, it was found that Julia's body was in perfect condition, just as the day she died. Now, that's interesting enough. But the spirit of Julia has been seen walking through the cemetery at night and walking along the road just beyond us. There are people who claim that they've actually smelled a miraculous scent of roses, even though there are no roses present. I used to work as a floral designer, and I know each color rose has a different scent, and these were definitely very sweet, small like, tea roses, baby roses. And uh, I kept smelling, and I didn't say too much, and about, oh, 15 minutes later, we were on the bus, and Mr. Crow said, how many of you smell roses? And there were about four or five of us that smelled the roses. And it was the middle of, you know, beginning of November. As we wrap up the Chicago Supernatural Tour today, I'd like to thank you all for coming along. I hope you've had an enjoyable day. No matter where you go, I want you always to remember to support your local ghosts. Weir Lake, Oklawaha, Florida. This lonely house was the site in 1935 of the lonely house was the site in 1935 of the longest shootout in FBI history. Notorious gangster Ma Barker had gone into hiding with her son Freddy and an amazing arsenal of weapons. After the shootout, the house was riddled with bullet holes. And so were the gangsters, mother and son. Inside, the house was completely wrecked. Only the chandelier and the china cabinet survived the FBI bullets. Today, the same chandelier still hangs there, but the sinister history of the house is brought back by the bullet holes in the plaster and the doors. Grim reminders of a violent past. Now the house is a holiday home for its owner, Mrs. Elizabeth Turnant. She comes here regularly in the summer and recalls how the family first realized, soon after the shooting, that the house harbored more than mere memories. We began to hear noises, especially at night. It was like people walking when we were upstairs. We would hear people walking downstairs, and there would be nobody there. Then there were times when we would hear, the peop hear someone downstairs playing cards. It was like a lot of people, not just three or four. And there was a lot of talking, loud talking, uh, so loud that you could almost hear the words they were saying, but you couldn't quite catch them. And you'd hear the cards slapping down on the table and the arguments and kind of almost yelling at each other. And you'd hear the chips going down on the table. But you could never find anybody down there when you'd run down. Her daughter remembers what happened when three boys came to spend the night. Betty and Good. The next morning, uh, one of the boys was very upset. And he said he had stayed up later than the other ones. And that, that he had um, gone into bed, gotten in bed and gotten almost asleep when all of a sudden he saw or heard someone sitting at the end of his bed and he heard someone combing their long hair and he reached over and the boy next to him was there and he reached over and the other one was in the other bed and he just quickly tried to wake all of them up and, then, and the next morning he swore on a bible that this had actually happened that he was sure that that was Ma Barker sitting on his bed I think the family is now convinced that it couldn't have been anything else but ghosts on my Barker's spirit?
The ancient city of York boasts one of Britain's weirdest sightings. In the shadow of the Minster stands what some people claim is the world's most haunted building, Treasurer's House. An army of Roman soldiers is said to tramp through its gloomy cellars. Harry Martindale, then an apprentice plumber, saw them in 1953. He often revisits the site with tourists. Martindale was installing central heating pipes in a vault which, unknown to him, had been built on top of a Roman road. Suddenly, a Roman soldier marched through the wall. He came straight out to the wall, across the cellar, and through the wall opposite here. Immediately he came out of a wall, then I started to see a horse come straight out of the wall with the Roman soldier set astride it. Across the cellar, and through the wall opposite here. Once the horse had cleared the wall, then there was a complete column of Roman soldiers came out behind the horse. One of the first things that struck me was when they came through the wall, I couldn't see any of them from the knees down until they came to where the hole had been excavated in the centre of the cellar floor here. And then for about two paces, I actually saw them walking on the surface of the Roman road. The first thing I looked at was the helmet. The helmet came straight underneath the chin here, then from the bottom of the helmet, I could see there was a growth of hair. Most of them had beards. On the top half, they wore the broad bands of leather joined together to form a jerkin with the bare arms coming out. And on the bottom half, they wore a skirt. But not one of them looked in my direction. And initially, this was a, a slight relief as far as I was concerned. These are traditional ghosts because they live in haunted houses. Is it possible that some places can store images of past events and then play them back in the right circumstances, like video recorders. This has been called the stone tape theory. And though it sounds utterly fantastic, something similar may happen with sounds. An American engineer, Richard Woodbridge, claims to have recaptured noises from the past and thus to have established a new science, acoustic archaeology. Dr. Woodbridge realized that one of man's oldest inventions, the potter's wheel, bears a family relationship to one of his latest, the phonograph. So he carefully explored the grooves in pottery with a sensitive pickup and believes that in at least one case, he was able to recapture the sound of the potter's wheel accidentally recorded. Well, if sounds can be frozen in time, could this also happen to images from the past? I've no idea how this could occur, but it's an intriguing possibility. But perhaps there's no need to look for such far-fetched explanations. There's little doubt that many ghosts are made of the products of overheated imaginations. On a journey through the United States in 1974, a terrifying vision confronted Vicky Brandon, a sinister motorcyclist. He looked so evil, you know, and sort of murderous. And, um... He was dressed in a, the biker sort of outfit, the um, leather sleeveless waistcoat with a big hairy chest and, and a sort of a big fat gut <laughs> hanging out over his belt. And a very sinister looking figure, really. And being alone there late at night, I, I was just um, paralyzed with fear, really. And um, I, had no, I thought, I'm going to be murdered, and I had no more thought it, and he was gone. <laughs> It just, just vanished into thin air. The menacing motorcyclist turned out to be just hallucination, as Vicky Brandon soon realized. I got out of the car and let the dog out, and we were both extremely sick, standing by the ditch. And I finally pulled myself together enough to get back in the car and when I opened the door I realized the reason for the trouble it was full of fumes and uh, I hadn't noticed them before because we were in there with it and um, as soon as I realized uh, as soon as I smelled it I, re I remembered that I had bought this stuff this um, starter spray which I think is ether or something in it and I'd thrown it in the back seat, and I suppose the uh, closure was leaking. And this had leaked all over the car, and we'd been inhaling these fumes for miles. Vicky's son, 15-year-old Jeff Brandon, had been begging her to buy him a motorbike. 
but Vicky was frightened of bikes and worried about her son. Upset by the fumes, her brain had conjured up the phantom biker. When you inhale any strong thing like that, it's like taking an anesthetic, but it, it mixes up your brain chemistry, and you have this business of seeing apparitions where um, there isn't anything there really, but what you are seeing is a projection of the imagery in your own mind. People who have seen ghosts have often found them so real and so terrifying. People who have seen ghosts have often found them so real and so terrifying that they've changed their entire lives to escape. Silverwood Colliery, Yorkshire. The miners go down to the coal face, but one man stays on the surface. Stephen Dimbleby has been afraid to venture down the pit since the day he encountered a spectral figure in the subterranean darkness. My first instincts were that it was someone, one of my mates mucking about, right? So I shoved my light in him onto his face and his shoulders and that. When I realised he's got no features on his face. And then he got like an old waistcoat thing on a t-shirt and his waistcoat was darker than his t-shirt but I couldn't really see colours because of mud. And he got an old helmet on like this one. These are uh, kind of helmets they use in them days. And then I realised that it was a ghost. And so I dropped all my tackle that I got with me. As I turned around and set off running towards Pit Bottom. And then the next thing I remember after that was waking up in hospital. And then after that, mates, when I saw them days after them, that, they tell me that the only thing they could get out of me was that I was saying, I've seen him, God help us, I've seen him. The pit holds such fears for him that Dimbleby has taken a huge pay cut to stay on the surface. I just know for definite I would never go down again. I'd sooner leave industry than go back down the pit. Carpet fitter Roy Fulton thought he knew what to expect on the byways of Bedfordshire. But there's one journey he'll never do again in the dark. He was driving home on the deserted road from Stanbridge to Tottenham when the headlights of his van picked out a lonely hitchhiker. There was a figure thumbing a lift on a street light down here on the left hand side. I'll stop just down here and let you see where it is. So we're there now. I thought myself you could either be going to Tottenham or Dunstable. So I thought myself I'd give the lad a lift. He actually walked back into the headlights of the van. He opened the van door. He got in, sat down. I asked him where he wanted to go. And all he said was, well, Wolves, he, he never said a word, he just pointed up the road. I started the van up, drove off, never made no conversation. It was just about now I leant forward, picked up me packet of cigarettes. In fact, it was just about here. Turned round to offer the, the lad one, and that man or boy was not sitting there. And well, <laughs> I just frightened the life out of me. I turned round and had a look in the back, and I realised that he wasn't in there, because by this time I had, me, I had switched the interior light on. And by this time I was just sort of panicking, and I just put it in first gear, and I went like a bat out of hell. And the sanctuary he headed for was his local pub, the Glider. Landlord Bill Stone remembers Fulton coming in, shaking and white as a sheet. He said to me, give us a large scotch quick. I said, have you seen a ghost or what? He said, yeah, I have. I've seen a ghost. I said, don't be silly, boy. He said, I've seen a ghost. He insisted that we had to go down the police station because he thought if anybody had got hurt or whatever it was, you know, he'd rather find out about it then, you know, than another day. And, um, I mean, at when we got home it was still on his mind and uh, in fact we slept with all the lights on because he was so convinced that it would i don't know why that it would come home follow him home there's obviously someone got in that motor and i do not know at this day what it was i 
For a council house tenant in Grimsby, the shuffling figure of a hooded monk was too much to bear. Driven from her home, Sharon Grenny is moving with her children to a safer place. My little daughter used to sleep in here and I was, she slept in here for about three months when she started having bad nightmares, saying that something had came into the bedroom, woke her up at night with dishcloths over its face. I was lying in my bed and this man came into my room and the dishcloths over his head and I could see his face. She used to come into my bedroom crying at nights and that, and I just used to put her in bed with me and she used to go fast off to sleep again. Well then it started getting pretty regular that she was waking up saying this. So I moved her out of this bedroom and put her into the back bedroom. And after a couple of nights she started having, started going to sleep every night and not waking up at all. And I put all the toys and that in there but she would never come into this bedroom and play. A few weeks later, after her friend Janet had seen the faceless creature, Sharon met it herself. It was about half past eight at night and I was putting my little boy to bed, just tucking him in and my lights went out and I started hearing all shuffling noises. And when my lights came back on, it came walking into the bedroom and it stood at the foot of my bed. I couldn't see no eyes or no nose or anything, just his, his hood. I couldn't see no ear and I stood there staring at him and I thought, well, if I run out of the bedroom, is he going to shut me in? Is he going to keep me in, you know, sort of like try and lock me in the bedroom? And I sort of like something just come over me to run out of the bedroom. And I forgot all about me little boy. I just run out of the bedroom, straight down the stairs. And then I asked Janet to come back up the stairs with me and get me little boy out. And when we came back up the stairs, got me little boy out of the bedroom and it had gone. And now the understanding council has found Sharon another home. I've no doubt that people really do see apparitions. But I don't believe that the dead return. It's very rare for two people to see a ghost at the same time, which makes me suspect that it's all in the eye of the beholder. So here's a theory of mine that may be crazy enough to be true. The human eye is a camera. It forms an image of the outer world on its sensitive screen, the retina, and then transmits it to the brain. Could the system sometimes work in reverse so that the brain sends images to the eye making it not a camera, but a TV screen, then believing would be seeing. This phenomenon might be caused by grief, by powerful emotions, by drugs, or plain expectation. But is there any point in adding to the pile of theories? We all love a good ghost story. Do we really want to know the mundane truth?